goes, and feel free. The moon and stars that night, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him.
and a word was heard at the tomb that day, just shuffling soldiers' feet as they guarded the grave. One day, two days, three days had passed. Could it be?
the first 12 verses. Let us share together. The historical event recorded in Holy Scripture and the lessons therefrom. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the women, came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves. And then he went home, amazed at what had happened. May God have God's blessing. To the reading of his word. God's good news. I have to tell you that my entire life long, I always wrestled with the fact that women couldn't be ministers, priests, or preachers. I know for a lot of the culture, especially back in the 1960s and 70s, they had a lot of problem with women being priests and ministers. And the Catholic Church still to this day has a problem with women being priests and they get regulated to the nunnery. But you do realize here, and this is recorded in all four Gospels, that it is the women that are the first preachers of the good news. The men are all hiding out in the upper room thinking they're the next ones to be arrested and crucified on the cross. doing the duties that were appointed to them at the time, go to the grave on the day after the Sabbath, because this would have been considered work on the Sabbath, to take care of their Lord and their Savior. And what they find changes the world. Be thankful that we don't live back in the days when Rome ruled the world. It was a brutal time in human history. Women were considered property. If you had a disease, you were outcast. If you were handicapped, you were left for dead. If you were orphaned or widowed, you were on your own. And the value of a human life was worth about what a penny is today. That's the world that the Son of God came into. And who knows, it might have been the world we would have came into 
had it not been for God's good news. Not to say that we've come where we should have come. We've come a long way from those days. But the value of a human life or of someone's opinion, the way we were divided by gender, nationality, economic class, was much more severe and distinct than it is in the 21st century. And I would say to you, that is all because of what happened on this morning, some 2,000 years ago. The founding fathers of this country were all Christians. And it was them who expressed this notion that each of us, regardless of nationality or gender or lifestyle, had equal and unalienable rights before God and before each other. That's a Christian notion. Not some other kind of notion from some other aspect of the world. This came out of Christianity. And women being able to vote, the doing away with slavery, the building of hospitals and nursing homes and orphanages <clears throat> and the whole idea that we live together on this planet and our nationalities don't matter all come out of what Christ did and what Christ shown and what Christ taught. We were born into a much gentler world because of Christ's resurrection. We came into a much kinder world because of God breaking in and changing how we dealt with each other. There's some subtle differences in the four versions of the resurrection story. Each have their own unique features, and yet also each have their own thing in common. They all account that on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb to embalm or anoint the body of their Lord and Savior. When they get there, they find the stone is rolled away, and depending on the version, some of them have just one man in dazzling clothes. Some of one of the versions says it's an angel. Luke's version is two men in dazzling clothes. That we are assuming are angels. And of course, just like us, if we went to the graveyard to visit one of our loved ones and we ran into two men in dazzling clothes, we would also be terrified that these two men tell the women that they are looking for the living among the dead and that Jesus isn't there. I imagine that if someone would come and tell us this story, we might not believe it either. And the disciples According to Luke, thought that these were just wasted words. But Peter goes and verifies what the women told them. And then from there on, the world was a different place. Friday, we talked about the gift of grace. The grace that is forgiven not only all of the sins of our past, but also our sins of today, and a grace that goes in front of us, provenient grace. The grace that forgives us of the sins we haven't even committed yet, because we have a God that loves us that much. And while this grace is free for us, 
Not based upon our good works, thank God. Not based upon how holy we think we are, thank God. But based upon what God has done for us. Grace was certainly not free for the Son of God. And I think that's an important point to bring up at Easter. You know, we like to love, and we want love to be easy and free. And we don't want to think of love as a self-sacrifice. That's what love is, isn't it? A pouring out of one's energy and spirit, of resources and devotion, of the giving up of oneself for the betterment of others. That's what we learned through Jesus Christ. And of course, he taught us that the greatest love is when we lay down our life for someone else. And that's what he did for us. And that's what this world so desperately needs right now. A self-giving love that benefits others. And we find our joy in their benefit. That's what Jesus did for us. We wouldn't even have the standing, if you want to put, use that term, authority, to even be worthy enough to come into this house dedicated to God if it were not for His self-giving, self-sacrificing love for us. I know a lot of people in this world that say they love things. They say they even love me. But they don't want that love to cost them a single penny or a drop of blood or maybe even a second of their time. And yet, God loves us so much that He gave His only Son not to condemn the world, but that we might be saved. And that's really the last point I'd like to take here on our Easter Sunday morning sermon. And that point is, is that we have the ultimate Savior, Redeemer, friend, companion, Reconciler, restorer, and the priest that is above all priests in Jesus Christ. That's God's good news for each of us. Unless you think you can get yourself into heaven. Didn't think so. Unless you think that I can forgive you of the sins you committed against God. I can't. You see, we know we have this need. And some, unfortunately too many people in the world, are looking for some other way to satisfy it. Instead of looking at the one who does satisfy. the Redeemer and Savior of the whole world that includes you and I. That makes us right with God again. That restores us when we break ourselves. That makes us whole again when we've made a mess of everything. And that sets everything right again. That has given us the ability to treat one another the way we want to be treated. Regardless of nationality or lifestyle or gender or opinions and beliefs. And this is our job as Christians, brothers and sisters. Not to go out and make as much money as we can. Or to walk over others on our way to the top. But to love. 
the way we were loved. It's time to start. We have so many generations of those who began this process for us. And you can go through St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or St. Francis of Assisi or Martin Luther or John Calvin or John Wesley, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, having a discussion not too long ago with another minister, Jerry Grubbs, we wondered whether another Billy Graham will ever come along. We both kind of felt like it's a different world today than it was back in those days. But yet we had hope that maybe this generation or the generation behind us will see this good news and act upon it accordingly and love the way we are loved. Forgive the way we are forgiven. Behave the way we were shown. And treat each other with the same kind of honor and dignity and respect that the Son of God treated us. That's God's good news. The Savior, the Redeemer, the reconciler, the making whole, the healer, and making whole again. The great high priest that you can go to in prayer or in thought, in your time of need, and he is right there for you every time. And maybe most importantly, our best friend. I have to tell you that doing ministry in the 21st century is not an easy profession. We live in a very, what the seminarians would call, secular world. Where the goals and desires of most of the culture around us is the pursuit of money and the pursuit of pleasure. And as I've said many times from this pulpit, have you ever met anybody who made enough money? Have you ever met anybody who had too much pleasure? You see, it's never satisfied. It's never enough. But with our best friend, there does come joy, contentment, and peace. There comes the faith and the hope that God is in charge and that all is going to be okay. There also comes that sense of peace that I am forgiven even though I am a sinner. And while not perfect, I can continue to strive to do the best I can to get there because I have a friend that will pick me up every time I fall short. And there's also a joy that comes with this day that we are never alone. That no matter where our footsteps go and no matter where our journey leads us, we have a, a companion. We have one who's walking with us. We have one who knows what it's like to be in our shoes and to deal with the struggles and the difficulties that come with living this life. It's not easy. Don't let anyone fool you that it is. In fact, being a Christian is even harder in today's secular world. And yet it's all worth it. I think of a saint like Gene Wolsey, who was a Christian, woman born, and became orphaned. Didn't have a mom and dad like a lot of you and I have and had. And even with all the different struggles that she had growing up in small town rural Indiana, God blessed her with a partner, with a family, and 
and with a faith that no matter what struggle she went through, God was with her. And look what Jean did with her life. It wasn't about serving Jean. It was about being an instructor to the younger people on how to live and giving them the tools they needed to balance their checkbook or know how to type and do the daily functions of life in America in the 20th century. And her whole life was committed to the betterment of others. Meredith Fry and many, many, many others who did the same things with their energies. And we all have received the blessings that come because of their self-giving love. The best good news that God gives us this day is that we have a friend. We have a Savior. We have a Lord. We have a Redeemer. We have a companion. And because of that, we have salvation, redemption, and all the blessings that come from knowing Him.